at the back of it that the action of tongue up now again like I say proven in medical science it will improve your breathing or apnea uh, index by 50% or even up to 63% I would just say that uh, when your heart stops we die if the tongue stops we die simple as that you can go to the Singapore National Dental Center and look at that section on gum disease gingivitis and parodontitis 90% of the population has either the gingivitis or parodontitis wow yeah. my so goodness I heard of mewing is this a social media fact? Welcome back to episode four of the Best of Both Worlds podcast, where we look to discuss, consider, and potentially find the humor in our quest as healthcare practitioners to optimize performance. That is sports performance, emotional performance, psychological performance, and just performance in life in general. We hope to learn with you, to share with you, and create powerful high-performance lives. I'm Matt Winter, Doctor of Physical Therapy with Training in Functional Medicine, and I'm here with Paul McCauley, Senior Podiatrist, Otherwise known on TikTok as the legendary Paul the Podiatrist. How are you doing, Paul? I'm well. I'm well. You know how much I love that intro, so thank you again. I like the way that you keep writing it in there, you know, so that everybody knows that I'm that famous, especially after this week as well. And overly confident. Well, I had a 9.7 million views on one of my videos this week. That's pretty big. It annoys me a bit because we put up so much good content. And you got 9.7 million views on taping the foot. Yeah, it took me 11 minutes to do. So thank you very much. Well, congratulations. I'm a creative genius. Humble. So again, today we have a very special guest. Um, and I'm going to introduce them right now. This is Dr. Yu Weng Chu. He's a pioneer in the field of dentistry. He graduated from NUS Dentistry and has been elected as a fellow of the Royal Australian College of Dental Surgeons and International College of Dentists. Dr. Yu has also obtained his membership of the Joint Dental Faculties of the Royal College of Surgeons in the UK. As aside from his various accreditations, he has completed the full TMD continuum at Occlusion Connections in the USA and finished his mini resid residency on dental sleep medicine with Tufts University School of Medicine. What has separated Dr. Yu in his field is his ability to gain remarkable results in tooth alignment and resolution of jaw pain and TMJ disorders without extracting teeth. And I think that's the key part, without extracting teeth. Perhaps key to this success has been his focus on the tongue as central to the anatomy and development of the face and was a topic of his TED talk. It is with this and his func functional and integrated approach to dentistry that we'll be discussing today. So, welcome, Dr. Yu. Well, thank you, Paul. Thank you, Matt, and for having me. Yep. No problem. And uh, so we have a tradition. It's now three, four, four episodes four old. Episodes four old. episodes old. And we ask our um, guests, how are you out of 10? I think I'm at a nine at the moment. Wow. Yeah. That's good. That's it's high, isn't it? It's high, it's high. Loving I'm that. Like, why, why, why so high? Uh, I, I really enjoy seeing um, your practice, right? And... Uh, and knowing what you're doing, and uh, and I'm quite excited about what this can achieve as well. So um, uh, I'm I'm trying to energize myself too, right, to really just deliver this well, so that we can uh, really change some perception of this very underrated um, organ inside the mouth, mm. and how it's actually helping us uh, to become stronger and healthier. We can just utilize it. We should utilize it. Yeah, that's fantastic. I think uh, Matt also visited your practice uh, a few few days ago and had a bit of a insight into exactly what you do. And I've I've looked through the videos. Oh my God, so interesting! Did you enjoy yourself, Matt? I had a great time actually. Um, first of all, thank you for your honesty and your excitement there. <laughs> um, yeah, I had a, I had a great time at the uh, at the clinic. I mean, the amount of depth that you go into. Um, it's very clear that you're pushing the boundaries in the tools that you have and the thought process you have. So I'm also really excited about today. Um, and how, how are you feeling out of 10? Um, really good today. Um, a good eight out of 10 as well. Oh, yeah. I, I, hit, I hit a low point in the week. I was a yeah. four. And I thank you so much for, um, for sort of checking in on me as well. And, and Paul, Paul said, 
is there anything I can do to help? And I basically said, don't talk to me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but well, it works for me. It works for me. No, it worked really well um, for both of us, clearly. Mm. Uh, but no, I picked up. I'm super excited about today. I'm also really happy because um, my mum got into the gym and started strength training. Fantastic. That, that made me happy. That is good. Um, the only thing that's tempered this excitement a little bit is when I went down to see Dr. Ewan Clinic, um, he took a scan of my face um, and he said that my jaw was paper thin and I shouldn't get into any fights. So <laughs> it's uh, not as perfect as you thought. So now everyone knows my weak point. No, well, <laughs> imperfections in imperfection, as the song said. Nice. How nice. are you out of 10? Um, I would say... Eight out of ten, yeah, eight out of ten. I've had I've had to work this morning again, um, but I had some great interactions with some patients, so that's really good and a great week. And, and my colleagues back from holiday on Monday, which will which will hopefully ease the stress a bit. Um, so yeah, really good, really brilliant, good. That's solid. Should we get into it? Yeah, let's get into it. <laughs> All right, let's go. First question. Right. Is the tongue the most important muscle in the body? I think the, the, the word most is really hard to qualify at times, right? But I would say it, it, it is right up there with the heart, okay? I would just say that uh, when your heart stops, we die. Or if the tongue stops, we die. Simple as that, right? It's a very active um, system of muscles, intrinsic, extrinsic. Uh, they have to contort, distort, contract, let go, uh, to shape it in such a way that so I can talk. Uh, I can swallow while after talking. And then I should brace it against the roof of the mouth so that I can breathe. And then I keep talking again. So it, it is so busy. And I think we forgot that um, this, this, this tongue needs to work while we are sleeping as well. Right? So I think we will go a little bit into that as well later. Brilliant. And it's huge as well. I, I didn't quite realize how big the tongue is. I think we only see the top surface of yes. it, don't we? Yeah. So I, I, I make it simple for a patient to understand. It's like, you just clench your fist. This is about the size of your tongue. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Good, yeah. <laughs> I've, I've clearly got a smaller tongue as well. <laughs> so you know what they say about the size of the fist. <laughs> Small tongue. Small tongue. I'm just... <laughs> so, um, of course, it's not going to be this round uh, bowler shape, but it, it, it does uh, have to extend. And uh, the better extension, the better the opening of the airway. Right. So, um, I'm so glad that now that um, more science has gone into it, uh, and acceptance as well, so that we can apply this uh, across the board, especially in the field of uh, sleep medicine. Uh, even our national hospital, like Sing Health Groups, yeah, they're also putting it as a adjunctive treatment to help patients with snoring or obstructive sleep mm. apnea. And yeah, we'll definitely come on to that mm. a little bit later. Is it is it fairly is it fairly like recent that it's been studied? Um, it's more like uh, it's been ongoing for many years. Um, when I first joined the course for Tough Strike on medical uh, on sleep medicine, uh, I was one of the disruptor in the class because um, I was always putting out my hand and say, that, "Look, you know, instead of just looking at the structural improvement, we need to look at the functional component as well." Mm. But at that time, two zero one seven, uh, you can understand that most of the medical professionals are still not accepting this as the as an important component. Yeah. But yep. over the last uh, five, six years almost, yeah, it is so much uh, mainstream now. Yeah. Yep. All right. Very interesting. In preparing for the podcast, mm. I was, um, I really wanted to know, is there a structural connection between the tongue and the rest of the body? And there's a guy called Tom Myers who's become quite big um, over the last 20 years um, who has done some great dissection work. Yep. Um, and we'll put a link in the show notes to this. There's a great video, actually, mm. um, showing the structural connection between even the flexor tendons in the foot yep. and um, all the way up through the diaphragm yep. into the mediastinum. It was interesting you said the tongue and the heart. There's actually a fascial connection between the mediastinal fascia, yes. lungs, heart, into the tongue itself. Yep. Um, the implication being then that there is a structural connection and therefore what the tongue is doing could impact our biomechanics yes. and our posture. Is that something that you've been considering? Yep. So I, I, I think the um, interesting that you start from the base and talking about how it extends all the way up to uh, end as the tongue. And if you think about it, this whole fascial 
structural and muscular uh, part is just right in front of your uh, spine. Okay, so and where the, does the tongue ends? It ends with hanging in the mouth. No, it hangs against the palate, and the palate happened to be the base of your maxilla. And your maxilla is the whole. Uh, it, it supports the whole cranium. Right. So when the tongue is extended fully, it holds up the head. It will adjust your COC one into that neutral position. So just to clarify this for people listening, so the maxilla is almost the mid face, isn't it? Yes. It is what sits sort of under around the nose, the, the inner part of the cheek. So for a dentist sometimes or for most people when we talk about upper jaw, yeah, we look into the mouth and we just look at this part. Yeah. It's just like how you look at the tongue, you only see the top portion. But the maxilla actually starts from here or the side of your nose. So the top of the nose. Yeah. And it it like a triangle, right? Under side of your eye. Yeah. And it goes all the way to your psychomatic arch here, mm. and it ends at the base, and everything here is your upper jaw. So that a lot of the front of the face is the upper jaw. Exactly. Um, okay, and then when we say COC1, mm. we're talking about the top vertebrae in the spine, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that's what you were trying to explain to me in clinic. You asked me the question, how many joints are there <laughs> in the jaw? Surely you should, you should know that I would, very well. Well, I should do. Because you're I? a physio, mate. Right, you're a doctor should. of physio. Yeah, so I let myself down. Obviously, <laughs> I said two. Um, <laughs> and there's not, there's three. And what you were talking about was that, we, you know, we consider the TMJ, the temporomandibular joints, either yeah. side of the of the jaw there. Yeah. But then the third point And that one the, um, articulates your lower jaw. Yeah, yeah, the left and right joint articulates lower jaw. But we happen to be able to move our upper jaw, right? Yes, Paul? I'm saying yes, you're, you're looking at me saying yes, Paul. <laughs> so, so I'm just saying to illustrate, like, you know, if you want to eat a burger, all right, you have to tilt your head upwards. Yeah. Or you want to chuck down a, a pint of beer. <laughs> yeah. So in order to open the mouth, we, we, we articulate this way. Right. Mm. So not only your lower jaw will drop, but the upper jaw will also, yeah, turn up, pitch up. Mm. And that pitching is dependent on the articulation on your COC1. Okay. okay. So that's the connection between the jaw and the first vertebrae of the spine. Yep. What's, what's the connection further down? Or, or is it something that you look at when you're analyzing a patient? Or should we be looking at that? And you know, Paul is a podiatrist. You see a lot of um, mechanical deviations at the foot. Is, mm. Do you think it can reach that far down? Yes. So... Um, so once the whole cervical spine is uh, affected, then you can imagine, because we asked that question, why do the patient need to make that kind of adjustment, like a forehead posture and creating either kyphosis or lodosis, right? Um, there is an underlying need, and that need is to breathe. Mm. The most fun uh, basic function that we need to do. If the tongue happened to be lower, it's not in the roof of the mouth, the mass of the tongue might come down and sometimes even retrude or fall back towards the back of the throat, oropharynx, and will narrow down the airway. Mm. As we saw on your, yeah. your, 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 when Matt came into clinic, Correct. I saw her on his scan. So if we want to open it up, uh, one of the uh, simple method is to just forward the head, right? Yeah, so you hyperextend mm. and you will open up the airway. And this is exactly what we do in CPR. So, you know, when we teach, well, you know, I teach the pre-hospital care. And, when, and for anyone that's been trained in CPR, mm. we know we do a head tilt chin lift yeah. that's right. to open yeah. the airway, right? Yeah. And I guess that's what patients or people are mm. doing, walking around doing. They're doing their own head tilt chin that's lift right. to open the airway. So when we look at this functional um, movement, we always have to ask also who is in charge, right? Who is controlling this? Who is co coordinating this? And uh, I, fall, I will fall back to the cranial nerve to look at it. Mm. So when the mouth is closed, right, tongue is up, so our hypoglossal nerve is firing well, airway is patent, then I think less reaction. But if we open up the mouth and then the tongue is down, then now we need to activate the facial and trigeminal to open head tilt chin lift. Now we do the chin lift component. Uh -huh. And then head tilt will activate the accessory so that your sternocleidomastoid and your traps will also fire to hyperextend until you get to the point. So 
with one hypoglossal nerve not firing well, tongue is not extended, then the rest of the body is, say, oh, oh, he's not doing his job again. <laughs> no air. Then the brain will like, oh, come on, guys, do something. Yeah, yeah. Then the rest of them will overwork in order to do yeah. that. Similar, similar th- sort of thing like happens when, I mean, when we see a patient with leg length discrepancy in podiatry, the, often you see maybe the foot turns out a bit more or one foot rolls in. So the brain's like telling the body to do something else just to uh, make it sort of secure and stable. Uh, I guess we're, the body's always looking for that stability, right? Yes. And I think um, actually something you said very nicely to me was that at the ultimate thing the body's looking for is breathing, mm. right? To be able to breathe properly. And the other thing which I've heard is that we're always looking to have a stable visual plane, a yep. horizontal field. So everything then happens around that and all the compensations we see. So for you with the leg length, the body's trying to create horizontal visual mm-hmm. gaze, uh, a stable field, and then we're trying to breathe and all those things almost happen around that, right? Mm. Somewhere we need to meet in the middle. I guess going, going, if we go on to breathing a little bit, that kind of really impacts our next thought, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So. I think in the in the past few episodes we've spoken like loads about sleep, um, and so what I want to know is how does the tongue influence sleep? Mm. So um, we can't do all those practices and expect uh, the tongue to work when you're about to sleep or when you're sleeping. So we have to do more work when you're awake. Mm-hmm. So for the sixteen hours that you are in control, either consciously or subconsciously, uh, we need to work the tongue to the right position. Interestingly, to hold the tongue up, we can't plank it up whole day. Mm. Nobody can do a whole long, too long a plank, right? So we need to depend on physics to help us. So one of the ways is to uh, just seal your lips. Keep your mouth closed, right? So when the mouth is closed, every breath you take, every swallow you take, uh, you draw air out from the mouth and you will create a negative suction force within the oral cavity. This will facilitate the elevation of the tongue and it gets stuck to the roof of the mouth. Mm-hmm. You can yeah. feel that too, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The moment you open your mouth slightly, yeah, you can feel that air is leaking out, tongue descends. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So we need to create that suction force that can help you easily hold up the tongue. Right? So that's why we need to start working on your orbicularis oris uh, as the very primary action right, to get the good lip seal. After which, you get the tongue up. So in a daytime posture, when you're not talking, right, your lips are sealed, tongue is up. And every breath you take, maybe, how many times do you think you breathe a day? Gosh. <laughs> um, I have no idea. Maybe yeah. Should put a number out there? Uh, like 20,000? Wow. Well. Let's do some math. Simple math. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hang on a minute. Oh, it's easy, isn't Will it? Because your ventilation is per minute, so 15 per minute. Is it 15 per minute? Yeah, 12 to 15 per minute. 15 per minute times 60. All right, just tell us. Yeah. yeah. So so the guru level would be, yeah, about 6 to 8 per minute. So it goes into that 0.1 hertz. Um, the the 0.1 hertz, 6 to 8, 6 to 8 blinks of your eye. Yeah, that's per minute. So that's if you're like super healthy. So the 0.1 hertz frequency is the key. That's if you're like the Dalai Lama. Yeah. yeah, I'm very chill. Yeah. <laughs> not not getting stressed out. Not like us. Like work, right? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so for us, yes, you know, go by going by my my watch and, and sometimes my ring. Yes, uh, we'll do about twelve to fifteen. Mm-hmm. Eighteen will be really a bit excessive. So you said you said breathing and blinking is similar. So yeah, you do about six to seven blinks a day. What's is that? Is that another cranial nerve link with breathing and blinking? Is not that? not uh, okay. So we do see a relationship uh, at times uh, in the sense that um, there's overfiring of the facial nerve and then we see excessive blinking. Uh, if a child is not able to um, swallow effectively with the tongue up against the roof of the mouth, he will need accessory muscles from the face. Mm. So to brace the jaw, to swallow, yeah. So you see a uh, perioral movement of the face or you see a uh, cervical movement where they they mm. literally drop the head to 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 touch the tongue mm. yeah and some you can see excessive activation of that facial nerve and they will even blink yeah a lot and and it, you can just test this out to to ask the child or even an adult okay then you just say slow down your breathing right okay maybe just 10 per minute all right slow down your breathing 
put your tongue up against the roof of the mouth and close the mouth. And then just observe. Then you realize they'll do this. Their blinking slows down. Mm. Yeah, when they slow down their breathing. So it's all about the parasympathetic tone, right? Activating again. I um I had a friend that when when she eats, the facial expressions are incredible. <laughs> like the eyes close, like really cartoon like uh, maybe I shouldn't be talking in those terms, but <laughs> is is that ag- that's again that hyperactivity of the cranial nerves during yes, yeah. yes. So what's going on there? Is it the same thing? So you see, yeah, um, even from the very beginning as a baby, right? If you want to um, breastfeed, of course you have no, um, you know, conscious understanding of what you need to do. So everything is all about reflex, right? So if the moment the the nipple touches the face, then the signal through the facial nerve, right? will be sent to the trigeminal nucleus, right? So it gathers all the information to tell your accessory to also fire in such a way that it will turn towards the nipple. Mm. Mm. And then you have to tell it to fire your facial and trigeminal to open the mouth to latch. Mm. And then once latch, then the hypoglossal nerve and the glossopharyngeal, right, needs to start transferring the milk to the throat. Then the vagus nerve needs to control and say, hey, okay, let's stop breathing for a while. Allow the accumulation and swallow. And then we resume breathing. So, and then it starts the whole parasitic movement, right? Going down. And actually the baby, if you put it on the mummy's um, tummy, right? The baby can crawl his way to the nipple. Yeah, even though they might not have good eyesight, th- they can still target the areola. Uh, it's darkened. So with that, Whatever they can see through the optic nerve, yeah, they can go or go for it. And then, of course, uh, the vestibular nucleus, uh, cochlea, sorry, vestibular cochlea, help with the balancing. Then plus, the uh, olfactory, of course, they recognize the mother's smell. So all 12 cranial nerve is involved in just breastfeeding alone. Wow, that's and then, crazy. Then when you go for and think about chewing, I chew. I can continue talking to you. And I, I stop to, and then I move again, right? So when you're chewing, your face is moving, your tongue is moving, right? And it's also trying to push the bolus of food towards your teeth without being caught between your teeth. Mm. So your facial nerve, your trigeminal nerve, again, all this chewing thing going on, uh, know how to coordinate with your tongue. And then when you're ready, again, your swallow, your breathing and all that. And if you're upright, it's easier to chew and swallow. And if you're floating like an astronaut, it's going to be difficult, right? And if your eyes are if your eyes are closed, you're not getting any sense of smell, right? It's going to be difficult again. So, all your cranial nerve, even when you are eating and chewing, is being utilized. Mm. And you said to me just now that when the, the the tongue being on the roof of the mouth actually starts or yeah, I guess it starts digestion mm. in because it stimulates the vagus nerve, which, which stimulates that peristaltic movement through the stomach. Yes, that's why, so. that's why the, it actually activates the parasympathetic system. Right. right. Yes. Yeah. So uh, we know it as the rest and digest, feed and breathe, right? So when the tongue gets up to the roof of the mouth, it will activate the swallowing center in the medulla, and then that's how the whole, whole sequence of event, you know, peristalsis, moving things down, and then it it allows the, the parasympathetic tone also allow for the sphincter control to be good. So that's why if we go into an issue with breathing during sleep while we are lying down, okay, when we are <coughs> gasping for air, right, we will uh, switch, of course, uh, from a, sim- a par- parasympathetic system to a more sympathetic tone, right? Yes. Yes, because now we're gasping for air, we're out of breath. Okay, yep. life threatening because no oxygen, heart rate will go up, right, and then blood pressure goes up in order to help you to circulate quickly whatever left over oxygen in in your body to the rest of the organ system, particularly to the brain. Mm. So then, at that state, you are going to sympathetic tone. Remember, I always I watch those movie when the guy aim at this with a gun, aim a uh, person with a gun, and he will just pee in his pants, right? Yes. So the sphincter control suddenly during the sympathetic spike, let go. All right. So this person, when he's <coughs> fighting for air, he's not. The sphincter control is now getting poorer, especially in the gastric and also in the esophagus area. And then as you are sucking, <coughs> uh, 
you're creating a very low pressure in your throat area. Mm. And this low pressure is lower than your gut. And you get a backflow. And this is how reflux, reflux can happen. Wow, I've never heard it explained that elegantly. Yeah. Mm. And it goes all the way to the throat and sometimes even to your na- nasal passage and even to the ear because of the whole <coughs> very poor suction. Effect. I'm going to have to go back and listen to it again to fully understand it, but that was really interesting. What, what sort of like percentage of people like um, his tongue's in the wrong place when they're sleeping? Like I would say uh, huge. Based on the uh, uh, a paper published by Lancet, mm. right? Uh, it, it, it does mention, I did mention about at least 50% of the uh, population is in, in need of help for obstructive sleep apnea. Mm. Yeah. In Singapore, we have a paper pub, uh, published in 2012. Right? One third of our population suffer from moderate to severe sleep apnea, 91% undiagnosed, untreated. Mm. So that means even just a, a simple calculation, back of envelope, a million. Mm. If it's just 3 million Singaporean Right, uh, of course we are about five to six now, right? Uh, the rest is really transitional. I'm just like looking at that whole uh, Asian, mm. Asian population group that comes down from the south of China, mm. right? So we are uh, we are already a little bit um, compromised. Uh, so one of the paper studied published in Harvard, talking about OSA. Interestingly, it says that the being obese is not on a core relationship. Being Asian is. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, exactly. So our uh, Asian morphology uh, makes us a little bit more challenged at the back of the throat. So yes, uh, for Caucasian, sometimes you, you have to be a little bit more fat and you know obese, then it starts to get blocked. Mm. But for Asian, like my friend treating uh, sleep apnea cases, he has a, bun- a bit load of uh, sometimes the, the thinner Vietnamese uh, mm. immigrants that's not out snoring the, the fat uh, Caucasian. Right, so, so, so that's why in our culture, long time ago, we talk about all these breathing exercises. So in Qigong, in Tai Chi, we talk about She Di Shang Er. She Tou Di Shang Er means tongue up in the roof of the mouth. And in Pranayama, same thing, tongue up. In Vipassana, tongue up. Mm. Yeah. So when you go for a yoga class, if your teacher reminds you to put your tongue up and you practice breathing, right? I think the essence is there. The prana, the pranayama is being addressed not only just asana. Mm. So basically, we're in the wrong business, Matt. Um, we're in Singapore. We're in the wrong business. We need to be uh, in the den- dentistry. <laughs> tongue business. No, no, no. <laughs> I, think, I think the key thing is, right, you know, because of this, um, um, not the good awareness of where the tongue should be. So that's why during the day, they have this very bad forehead posture. Mm. And then at night when they sleep, they have hyperextension or sometimes they sleep on face down. Because when you f- face down to sleep, the jaw and the tongue falls away. So they didn't know that this uh, it, this is helping them with their uh, breathing, mm. but it's definitely not doing a favor for the neck. Mm. And, and so many patients ask me, what position should I be sleeping in? And my answer to them is, is v- whatever I think, it's very hard for you to change your sleeping position yeah. because you're ultimately going to take the position that is best for you, probably for you to breathe. And mm. I know for me, I have to sleep facing one side, which my girlfriend hates because, yeah. you it's know, not it's, not the f- it's not the side that she's on. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the side, yeah, because she wants a cuddle. Yeah, <laughs> but um, so I have to face on, and that's probably because my deviated, I imagine a deviated septum, um, which we'll come on to later. Um, but yeah, so I guess peop- when, when patients ask us as, you know, um, people that look at their mechanics, how should I be sleeping? would you say that that's being governed by their yep. efficiency of sleep and the tongue? So ideally, you know, if you look back, and again also uh, just uh, um, referencing my own culture, the Chinese culture, we have hard board beds, hard. And a pillow is either made of wood or jade, or stones, you know, light and soft. So it has a certain curvature, but it's all hard. Mm. Okay, so my son, my second son, only wants to sleep on the floor. He doesn't want to sleep on the bed. Yeah. And that I feel, right, even though he has some, I would feel still so some mouth breathing issue that I'm also addressing, but his posture is still doing very well. Okay. Why, why I say that is, obviously, you know, when we contort and distort the body to adapt for whatever reason, if the bed is softer, 
it was just going to um, be accommodating to this and we get stuck in that curvature for the whole night yeah but if it's all hard bought uh, if you can right sleep on your back open up and face up right it could be one of very very good position but not many people can do that because of the airway is blocked yeah habit is not good so, so if the surface is harder you'll turn eventually into a better position you don't even need to turn you literally face up to sleep all night so that's the ideal position because not the ideal okay. yeah I'm just saying that I'm just looking at this whole um, history going forward right it is just so simplistic the truth is right if we live like a caveman right we will be very strong and healthy we mm. chew hard everything here will be big and strong mm. we don't have to go to the gym we just literally till the soil get some water climb the hill get some fruits right uh, we will be very uh, well built as well right so again, the the body is adapted to very harsh environment. Mm. Yeah, the softer we go, softer food that we chew, softer bed, and softer, softer everything, soft, comfortable, is not ideal. Mm. Yeah, I need to get rid of my morning smoothie. Yeah, same, <laughs> same with the, the feet shoes. Yeah, yeah, I see you that you wearing the barefoot shoes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, 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 we don't want to get into that, do we? Um, So so as clinicians and and as patients, potential patients, people, um, what are some of the things that we can look out for that might give us clues that there is some sleep dysfunction going on? Of course, um, there's two simple tests that you can actually go through. One is called uh, Epworth sleep, right? Um, You can actually just ask a few questions to gather some ideas whether they are having daytime sleepiness yeah. and a stop, stop bang as well. So a, a few more in-depth questions also so for questionnaires. The other day, of course, you can just ask and uh, or you can just look. Um, of course, not all mouth breathers will have issues with sleeping. Um, and when, I, when we talk about having problem with sleep, yeah, what we are actually talking about, we're talking about they're having problem breathing when they're sleeping. Yeah, that's why they cannot sleep. So just, just imagine this, right? Um, when your mouth is open, uh, when you go into deep sleep, your muscles is very relaxed. Your tongue will fall back with your jaw. You will block your airway. So if your mouth open, you start with mouth breathing, you go... If it drops back a little bit more, it's narrow already. And if it drops back a little bit more, it goes... And straddle. Yes, yeah, straddle. And then once it's totally occluded, then you go. <sighs> yeah, right. Such a good impression. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> seen it all, man. Yeah, yeah. I've, 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 I've a few times been like had mates over for like sleepovers or whatever. What? No, not these days. <laughs> I mean, when I was younger, yeah. and I had a few friends who I noticed like they had uh, interesting <laughs> breathing habits. Yeah, one friend in particular. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's that's the that's the thing. You see. So we, we have been obsessed about obstructive sleep apnea because uh, it can be quantified to a certain extent. We use a certain matrix, uh, how many, uh, 10 seconds of stop, you know, they stop breathing and you, or hypopnea, then you manage, measure that. But the truth is there's this whole spectrum. So you go mouth breathing, up, uh, snoring, upper airway resistance, and then apnea. But no, no, no one will stay at one spot. It's just a spectrum that they move up depending on how tired they are, exercises, alcohol, among other things. Mm. Right? Mm. Okay. So, once we can't breathe that well, it, we start to deoxygenate. And that's when your body will pick it up and say, hey, okay, let, let's not bother you first. We'll let you sleep. So, for four to eight minutes, your heart rate will just go up for a while and see what happens. And if it's still not enough to address very quickly, your sleep will change from deep sleep to light sleep, allowing you to do some movement, right? So that movement allows you to change position, catch your breath, go back to sleep, mm. right? If it's not possible, uh, another action might come, it's called rhythmic masquetry muscle activity, RMMA for short, mm. right? So then it starts to project your jaw forward to catch your breath. <sighs> but when you do that, your teeth are in the way and then you end up with 
grinding Grinding. and clenching. Mm -hmm. And that's how you end up with TMJ from sleeping issues. Yes. So I'd heard it before, is this way of almost splinting the jaw to splint your airway. Is that is that so that's that's yeah, so so in a way, yeah. So in certain uh, uh, shall I say splints, uh, it can be helpful to bring things forward. Uh, but also we'll be mindful if you make splints on the roof of the mouth, sometimes it blocks the tongue. So it makes it harder. If the tongue cannot puck into the oral cavity, it will reverse. Sorry, what I, what I meant was th- th- that's almost like a natural way of splinting the airway by, by moving your jaw and yes, clenching. Yes, right? in a way, and yeah. yeah. Sorry, yeah, the mesketry muscle will help you to, 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 splint, to achieve that. To open that. There is these, these questionnaires. Something I sometimes ask, I ask, um, do you wake up gasping? Mm. Does your partner say you snore mm. um, or grind your teeth? Um, do you get very dry lips? Because that's often a sign of mouth breathing overnight, right? Yes. Um, are there any other specific questions that we can ask? I, I often say, do you feel rested in the morning? Mm. Do you feel like you're actually refreshed? Because yep. all of those things you just said would imply if your heart rate's gone up, yep. if you're in a light sleep and you're moving around a lot in your sleep, you're probably not going to feel great yep. in the morning. Are there any other questions? We no, I think, I think you, you, you make a very good um, few points asking all those questions which we we wish ha- we have another myofunctional uh, list as well so we talk about muscle function list so we can uh, ask quite a few things including yes whether your mouth breathe during the day also mm. yeah or whether the mouth is open during the day mm. are your teeth touching during the day mm. right so a lot of this uh, daytime habits will uh, give you an inkling of what they are doing at night when they sleep so if you have an open mouth posture during the day, very likely you're going to repeat that at night. So you have to change your daytime habit in order to improve the night. That's why myofunctional therapy now is uh, key in helping patients with all these sleep issues. Brilliant, love that. And there are any apps, people? I, I know there's something called Snore Lab mm-hmm. that um, I know people that use. Um, do you utilize apps or technology to monitor patient sleep? Yep. Uh, we do have a screening tool uh, it's called the uh, B E L U N Balloon Ring. It's a FDA approved uh, ring by uh, made in Hong Kong, right? So it's, I I understand it's also used in N U H, mm-hmm. right? When the the cardiologist is actually monitoring his high blood pressure or hypertensive patient mm. uh, throughout the night. To help this pa- group of patient, he actually uses uh, mandibular advancement device. Okay, so, uh, okay. So point is. This ring is placed on the index finger and it will take about 200 sampling, right? And then through the algorithm, it's able to give a good prediction. So this is still, uh, we call lavatory kind of test, which is good enough to screen about 86% uh, specificity and uh, sensitivity as well, right? But uh, to really properly you know, check, we still will refer to our uh, physician, who can do a standard sleep test, uh, PSG, Ponosonomaka. And can patients get this on their own or do they need to get these prescribed? Usually, uh, yeah, it's, it's best to get it prescribed. Of course, the screening thing, we get uh, uh, a certain level of uh, confidence in terms of the prediction, but the uh, sleep test will give a better idea. And now they're looking at uh, multiple channels also in the sense that not only just the apneic uh, AHI, um, how many times you stop, but you look at also your sleep disturbances, how many times you wake up, and also your oxygen level. Great. You know, there's, there's a patient who I keep coming back to um, in pretty much every podcast episode because we talk about sleep a lot and stress and all these things, and he actually struggles with his sleep because of his breathing. And he had sleep, he was diagnosed sleep apnea, got the machine, yeah. rips it off in the night. I yeah. see. So yeah. doesn't use it either, so it's affecting you as well. It's still a complex patient. So when I was when I went down to see Doctor Yu, he um, I saw the the splint that he has, which has wings mm. on the uh, on the splint. And can you maybe you can just explain qu- yep. quickly how that works? Because mm. this is potentially another option for yep. these patients that are correct. So I think uh, 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 CPAP is still the gold standard. Um, uh, there's some reservation, but I think it's still uh, helping a lot of patients with it. But of course, uh, wearing a, a trunk like machine. Uh, making noise sometimes they can't tolerate or the bit partner can't tolerate right so we uh, help them by getting something more light uh, easy to wear right so uh, we first have to determine a good position for the jaw to place this device Mm. Um, standard way is to put a fork or a measuring fork sorry 
uh, into the mouth and get the patient to protrude 100% maximum protrusion. And then you take the 50% mark as the reference and make the device. However, we learned from our training, right, is that you can induce joint pain because you can imagine the, the bite might be slightly off already at initial, so you move it to 100% off axis and they come back 50%, it's still not that comfortable for the patient. So that's why I, um, I'm lucky that I, I, I came from another angle or perspective. I was treating joint pain first before I, I went to sleep medicine. So I had to really balance off. So my patient is like everyone with a suspension alignment issue. They come to my workshop, I jack them up, I let the wheelbase hang loose, I know where is the floating point, and that's I determine that floating point. So I use a neuromuscular approach to relax down so that I can measure the upper jaw and lower jaw six axis position. Then that's my start point. Mm. So I can make a device, one upper lower with wings, and it stays at zero position at that neuromuscular point, which is already a little bit more forward already. Mm. Yeah. And if they need to, they can add one more. So another piece of the, the device can be fitted to protrude the jaw one more mm forward. Mm. And then there's another piece that you can wear to make it two mm forward. So it, it depends on how far they need to go. And the ENT doctor that they attend to uh, can give uh, better advice on that component. I assist in uh, building the sleep device for them. Yep. I really want to ask about when to refer to ENT. Um, is, it really, is it really important to deal with nasal issues before or do we address the jaw and the tongue first? Um, there's a lot of patients and there seems to be a lot of people in Singapore with allergies, sinus issues. Mm. You certainly, certainly as you walk around, it sounds like people are having lots of issues breathing. Mm. Um, do, do we need to deal with the allergy situation first? The, na the nas sinusitis, the nasal <laughs> obstructions, of or course do we start dealing with the tongue? I, mean, I would say the ideal world is, of course, one patient, we have 100 physicians surrounding that one, one person and giving every, uh, uh, all our perspective and then some AI will be able to you know, manage that and deal with it, give the best treatment plan. But in reality, we can't, right? So, um, but of course, as we, we work together, we, we can find like-minded um, individuals and prof uh, professionals and practitioners who can understand what we're trying to do. Because not all ENTs uh, look at airway and oral, right, and postural, mm -hmm. right? And not all, e all dentists look at this other direction as well. And of course, for you, uh, both of you are also look at finding interest in this oral and dental area. So we need to combine our effort and sometimes it's a, ju uh, it's a judgment call, right? Okay. All, ideally, all cases go. Ideally, all cases come to me. Ideally, all cases come to you. Mm. Yeah. But sometimes we will say, okay, let's just work to my maximum capacity, but I'm not going to drag for a, a year or two. Within that few weeks or months, let me just do this first and see where I go from there. If it's helpful, I think we're in the right direction. Let's continue first and see how it goes. But if patients still report, say, look, no things, then that might be other uh, structural issues, uh, be it in the nose, be it in the body, that we need to address. Then they should see the relevant uh, professionals. Yeah. Because actually closing the mouth and practicing that, that lip seal yeah. and the tongue on the roof forces them to breathe through their nose, which might clear yes. the nasal passages, it yes. might improve their immune system. It might because the in the sinus lining, we produces nitric oxide. So nitric oxide is such a wonderful gaseous uh, product that it can help to disinfect. And also, if you breathe through the nose, you can breathe deeper with more resistance, actually 50% more resistance if you breathe through the nose. And this deeper breathing gets this nitric oxide to the, the third lobe or the lower part of your lung. Mm. And nitric oxide is very good as a vasodilator. Right, so it's also helped with all your oxygen transfer, carbon dioxide transfer. It's all in the nose. <laughs> I love it. Crazy, it's deep. I am loving this. Yeah, I, know. <laughs> I can see. I can see. Yeah. Um, the mouth, the taping, mm -hmm. mouth taping, which is quite a trend on, like with yeah. all these fitness guys. Um, is that a similar thing? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the 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 all blacks and um, 
the, the SWAT team from US and I think recently there's a, 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 a tennis player in the WTA wore the tape to play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she did. Really? <laughs> Surely that's not efficient. <laughs> Is it, does it help? Not uh, to play. I mean, okay. I can understand to sleep, but to yeah. play. So, so I think that's, that's why we need to understand the basis and then you will know why and how to deal with it, right? Okay. Okay. First thing first is your orbicularis oris that needs to be cl uh, closing your mouth, okay? And we want this to close so that you can close your mouth at night when you sleep. But it's not about just which channel do you use. You use your nose or mouth to breathe. They don't. They're just channels. Do you use your diaphragm? To, okay. So diaphragm-wise, right, um, we have five diaphragms that's helping us to breathe. Tentori cerebelli, tongue, thoracic, diaphragm, pelvic floor. So all five will work together in conjunction and you, your body is pumped like a accordion. And then circulation is not only for air, but also for fluids. So one of the uh, researcher, Takashi Ono, uh, so he, he activated a breeding neuron of a cat and then he connected two points, the tongue and the diaphragm, and he see phasic kind of uh, contraction. And there's a French... Uh, um, I think he's a uh, osteopath, so he has a video which I will share with you. Uh, I will I'll check again. Yeah. yeah. So his this video was amazing, right? Showing how the body, um, literally like yeah, all your muscles, actually even just when you're breathing, you're actually massaging your internal organs, right? Yeah. So, so the pelvic floor is also a very under, how should I say, underappreciated uh, set of muscles for breathing purposes, right? So we need to also strengthen the pelvic floor. Yeah. I mean, I, I see a fair amount of women with pelvic floor dysfunction and I like, often refer them on to my women's health colleagues. Um, but I have one patient in particular I'm thinking of here, but I've tried to explain that when you have pelvic floor dysfunction, then your breathing is going to be impacted because you're trying to splint to create stability, right? You're trying to manage that pressure system. So you're not having the continence issues. When your breathing's out, um, then you're going to start using accessory muscles higher up to, to, to manage your breathing, and then it feeds into your sympathetic system and, 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 and causes anxiety or b vice versa. It's so connected. Correct. It's, so, it's, it's a real rabbit so, hole. So, so, yeah, exactly. So then now, just by thinking about whether a tape will work, it's too simplistic in terms of saying that I'm just breathing better if I have a tape on. Mm. What it does is that it seals off your lips so that you can have a better chance of... Yeah, forming that vacuum so that the tongue can stay up in the roof and not at the back of the throat. Yep. So maybe in a in a structural way, that's it. Yeah, mm. but we don't want to be passive if about this whole ma management. Mm. We want it to be active. So daytime awareness. So one of the things that we do also is that we give the patient a, a tablet uh, made of agar-agar cellulose. So this is uh, made in Australia. Actually, it's an Australia product made in Switzerland mm. called Myospot. You put it right up to the roof, the mouth, and it gets stuck there for an hour because it reacts with your saliva and it will melt slowly away. But while, while it's there, you train your tongue to make contact with it all the time when you're breathing or at rest. So this will then create the muscle memory and strength. Mm. So to answer the question, we need to active train during the day. And, uh, and answer to Paul's question, we can do passive treatment during the night, which is the lip seal. Mm. Is that, would you support that? So that means, right, taping is passive. Yes. Yeah. So if if, uh, if you try so hard during the day to close and nighttime you're still opening up a little, I think it's not wrong. Mm. And But always try to be safe. So a single strip or double, right, will be good not to tape the whole mouth. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, well, and, when, and they try to do it for kids as well. To me, it's, I think it's, Let's address the real issue first before we just uh, seal off. If their nose is blocked and you block their mouth, how can they breathe? So, so basically, the the tape is like the the orthotic mm. because the tape is just like um, cheat code. But no, they still got to do their exercises in yes. the day, which is what was a struggle to get people to do. <laughs> now you've nailed that analogy. Thank you. <laughs> Shows I've been listening, eh? All right, shall we? Let's move on to. I've heard of mewing. Is this a social media fad? Thankfully, uh, it became one. Mewing came from the last name of Professor John Mews. 
he is uh, or was an uh, orthodontist. All this while, he was always advocating that we can use some function to improve on the alignment expansion of jaw. But of course, uh, the fraternity might have some uh, difficulty accepting this initially, right? So uh, all this while, he has to struggle to get that through. So mewing was uh, related to his way of treatment. And then a few guys caught the idea that if you mew or do those exercises, close your mouth, put your tongue up, and your jawline will improve. So simply because if you think about it, it's very simple. When you open your mouth, your jaw rotates backwards. So then you end up with a long face growing down. And that is not a good nice profile and you're not activating the mid face. But if you close your mouth, your lips are drawn forward, your whole chin is drawn forward, your jaw level off, and your tongue goes up and expand your upper mid face, or you know, or mid face should I say, and then the whole profile will grow nicely. So it's true of just very functional thinking. But of course John Mill's name came by, then picked up by some guys, and they, they reported that doing that looks good. And then everyone start thinking about mewing because of the aesthetic component to it. But as all things, right, sometimes we want to have that latch point and say, hey, what gets people thinking and doing things, right? So if aesthetic is the case, so be it. But we know at the back of it that the action of tongue up now, again, I say proven in medical science, it will improve your breathing or apnea uh, index by 50% or even up to 63% for children. So mm. half the better one just getting the tongue up. So fine, just mew your way yeah. through to sleep. Yeah. Boom, smashed it. Love that. Is mewing more effective for children and adolescents? And does mewing still have an effect in an adult population? I would imagine it would still help breathing, but can we still have an aesthetic yeah, benefit yeah, yeah, yeah. by practicing this? So I think, again, um, let me just maybe we change the word mewing to a more standard term that can be uh, easily searched and accepted, uh, both maybe from the layperson and also the scientific. So the word is called myofunctional therapy. Myo, M-Y-O for muscle, functional therapy. So this, if you use this word, it cuts across all fields already. Okay, so good. So if you use myofunctional therapy, yes, it can guide growth and development for children. It can help adult to improve on the, the, the jaw. If, if let's say you get one patient with a click, when you open and get click, you get the person to just put the tongue up in the roof and open and close. That's me, probably. Yeah, try that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Can't even open my mouth. Don't do it again. The click mm. reduces or it sometimes even doesn't happen. You got to yeah. get the whole tongue up there, right? You, you, you can just start simple start for with him the first. Yeah, with the the oh, yeah, start very basic for me. I struggle <laughs> with like basic things. <laughs> so key point. Open the mouth. So key point is that right? The myofunctional therapy looks into uh, all kinds of orofacial uh, myology, uh, action and function. Uh, of course, a strong feature is the tongue. All right, and it's not only the tongue, but a strong feature. So when you get get the tongue into the center, the tongue really guides all the axis and uh, allow for the functional trajectories to be more neutral. Then from there, joint pain and all this gets much better, airways open up. And sometimes when we're doing orthodontics, how can I don't extract? I can't expand the bone for my patient. I can't, it's not me, but my patient can do it for themselves. So if they're growing and they have growth hormone that's really flushing the whole body like a, a teenager, perfect if they get the tongue up naturally the jaw will just um, grow to the size of the jaw just like the car parking back into the sp the space and the, the teeth are like traffic cones they have to give way to the ta car okay for adult patient we have gone to a not so active stage of growth but if we can't change our body form we have you know the gym has no business at all <laughs> no one is doing anything anymore so but also it's slow. How can we reactivate? So that's why when we're doing orthodontics, like for example with aligners, in order for teeth to move, we have to uh, loosen the bone a little. But when that happens, it will create this regional aspiratory phenomenon, right? So the bone activity now stimulate this whole flux in the whole jaw bone. And if the tongue comes back in, well, we do get some uh, very nice uh, bone distortion 
Wow. Actually, you're good. So we get remodeling of the bone, that wolf's mm. law we spoke about, That's right? That's right. Um, because of the consistent forces. I love that. That's good. Are there any structural barriers to progressing? So I've heard of tongue tie. Can you explain what that is and mm. does that get in the way? Yep. So um, the tongue tie sounds very absolute, right? So that's why there's the term now called restrictive lingual freedom, tongue freedom. So it's restricted. And uh, I, I, I'm, I'm very fortunate to have the opportunity to treat babies, uh, almost 400 babies for tongue tie release um, during the 2016 to 2018 period. So yes, um, they, they can't breastfeed, they have reflux, regurgitation, uh, they can't sleep. They, once they're on their back, <coughs> the airway get blocked. So um, through the pediatrician, lactation consultant, and sometimes the body workers sending them to us, we do the evaluation explanation. Uh, we use our laser to help them to release. So sometimes the procedure can be as quick as 30 seconds, right? The tongue is freed. The baby can return to breastfeed immediately. Yeah. Then we went on to continue to see children and adults. And yes, uh, one of the very significant cases, one patient with uh, a tongue tie and he has a very severe neck um, issue. And uh, after he went through every other option and came to us, I addressed a tongue tie. I didn't expect it, but in three months, he was very uprighted. So, so these are all my learning cases as well, where sometimes um, the, uh, when we address this, we can see that when the tongue is free to lift, right, the tongue returns to the right position, postural, neurological, yeah, gastrointestinal, dental, sleep, yeah, blah, blah, blah. everything gets uh, improved. And how might a person recognize that they have a tongue tie? It is uh, something hard to tell. Uh, it has four grades. Sometimes it's the, the first grade is like everything can open up. Second is something from below the midpoint. Yeah, something is restricted. The third type is above the midpoint and to the tip, anywhere around there is, uh, is connected. And the fourth type is right at the tip. So the right at the tip type is most of evident. Uh, if, I, if I stick out the tongue, Okay, so, so I think you explained it to me in the other day when I saw you in clinic that it, it's the sort of frenum or the frenulum that yep. sits underneath the tongue, yes. which is that piece of tissue that looks yes. like a sort of yes. bit of tentage. Yep. Um, it goes normally to the base of the tongue. Yeah, sometimes it's just not, you don't see it there you at all. You don't see it at all, and, sometimes it goes, and then it can protrude further forwards. Yes. And it's almost the further forwards towards the tip it gets, the yep. more restricted you get. In a way, right? in a way. But again, let's say there's two factors to it. One is a physical restriction. The other one is sometimes there's no restriction and yet because of the habit and function, the conditioning, the tongue doesn't get up there as well. So we have to start the evaluation by conditioning first. So we keep the tongue, uh, do some myofunctional exercises so then we can get to see how far the tongue can go and then from there we can see uh, uh, more obviously, is, is there any restriction? In and some countries, of course. Uh, so sorry, just that the, the language itself uh, can determine it for you. So uh, English, Chinese, uh, Mandarin, we can get away with it. But if you are speaking, like for for example, like Portuguese, Brazilian, then you're like you can't roll, you can't do your <laughs> your word. You got to see it. Time to cut that tongue. Yeah. Okay. All right. So it sounds like the tongue, through its effect on breathing should affect performance. Um, do you see that as a big player? Yeah, I think uh, it hops back to what uh, Matthew highlighted earlier, right? It's the whole anatomy chain, the deep front line, right? And when the tongue supports, it has a, a neurological reset or too neutral, mm. right? So it's not just a physical support, but also from the trigeminal nucleus and the vestibular nucleus point of view, it is also communicated and the loop is closed. So when the tongue is up, you can even test it with your clients or patient, right? Sometimes when you get them to open their mouth and you try, they will move uh, more, uh, like I say, not stable. Mm. But when the tongue is up, they lock in their neck and the cervical spine is in the right position, right? That has a very good downstream effect. So not only from the tongue perspective, the teeth also uh, may affect this whole balance point. So again, nobody has a perfect uh, occlusion. I saw only one case in my 25 years of, uh, uh, should I say, career. Um, the unevenness in terms of the bite also uh, result in the unevenness in terms of the jaw joint and neck joint position. So that can affect performance in terms of stability. 
Mm. So when we can use the same method to uh, re-establish, just like how you can measure up the person and get the orthotic to uh, rebalance the pelvic. Yeah, so I, I work from the other end. Yep. So I start from the head neck area. So by combination, I think we can get an individual into a more neutral state. Mm. And actually, interestingly, yeah, it's a more optimized state as well. Yeah. Well, when you saw that perfect um, jaw or mouth position, right. how did you feel? Like, was it epiphany? <laughs> did you take a selfie with that patient, <laughs> um, post it on the socials? Or how did you, how did you react to that? It's actually from measurement. Yeah, okay. so I have that six axis measurement oh, yeah. and I check his bike and I, and I check his, um, um, like say, stretch and relax free position. They correspond. Mm. This is the only case I see that the two uh, s you know, space is corresponding. Yeah. Everyone else, usually given a, a, an option, their jaw wants to come down and forward a bit more. Yeah. When, you, when you saw him, did your jaw drop with surprise? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, so go on. And, uh, and ha yeah, he, is, he didn't. My did. Did. Yeah. <laughs> and then how about like obviously Matt he tried on the the, yep. the thing how how far off was he again I say we, we you can be honest it's fine yeah. Yeah. so you can see his uh, frontal lines right so he's he's drawing very clearly yeah so uh, that one wasn't much of a deviation mm. but then when it comes to the uh, the anterior posterior sagittal plane right uh, we can tell that the the, 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 the jaw wants to go out Maybe just about one one point something mm. Oh, that's big, isn't it? Whoa. Yeah, that's brutal. <laughs> I'll have to have a word with my parents. <laughs> <laughs> you gave me one mm less. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about the jaw still. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. So, <laughs> thanks so much. I think we I think we can wrap on that point with <laughs> yeah, this yeah, yeah. structure. Um, let's I'll take a slight segue here. Mm. There's there's a lot of talk now about oral health. Right. I think I think it's great to see. I think Singapore's taking a little bit more notice in oral health as well. There seems to be more research emerging on how oral health links to cardiovascular health, um, even Alzheimer's disease. And I know when I came down to the clinic to see you, um, you did a really interesting test where you took a little bit of a scraping of my uh, plaque, right? My yes, oral plaque. Yeah, that's right. And then put it into a, a reagent. And then we had a look at it on the screen yes. to see the uh, bacterial kind of colony colonies within my mouth. You're right. Um, can you explain for people listening the link between oral health and systemic health or systemic inflammation and yep. risk? I think um, from all that breathing, all, you can see that, yeah, from just the breathing passageway and the pattern that we use uh, can affect. But of course, uh, when you o m breathe through your mouth, there's also a higher tendency for decay because your teeth need to be bathed in saliva all the time. So if it's not uh, wet enough, yeah, and the, the, the lips as well, right, and the tongue and the lips and the gums, they are not protected by saliva, bacteria can start to grow. And also because of the drying of the mouth, more fermentation at certain areas, then you can drive the acidity down to the lower pH. Then you will favor certain type of bacteria over the others, right? So all that then start to change the oral microbiome. And uh, true enough, like for example, we know that uh, Helicobacter, uh, Helicobacter pylori, that cause all this ulcer, uh, really is uh, able to survive right, in an acidic medium. Mm. So if this kind of bacteria, we can test sometimes through, no, um, should I say uh, from a visual point, we can take samples from the gum we look at it. There are certain cockles and rods shape. Yeah, they are they are good to have, right? Because they are healthy kind of bacteria, and if they crowd the whole space out, good, healthy healthy environment. But there are other types of um, bacteria that look like little worms, mm -hmm. right? So the spirochetes, and we can even detect amoeba, right, inside certain mouth. So we can tell from this kind of uh, presentation, the individual is definitely compromised in terms of their immune system. And the mouth is also one big portal that all this can get through the uh, wound of the bad gums into the smaller vessels and then gets to the rest of the body. So that's why the European Federation of Periodontology uh, highlighted these three areas, cardiovascular health, pregnancy, and diabetic health, right? Uh, is very closely related to the oral systemic system. 
And you mentioned these spirochades can um, be a risk factor in the development of Alzheimer's, is that right? Mm. Yes, Alzheimer's dementia. So again, it's, it's, I think sometimes, uh, of course, we, ha we see a direct um, implication, but there's also indirect implication, meaning that uh, if you close your mouth, maybe, you know, uh, when the whole environment is better, right, it will be uh, less of this. Or we will try our best also to eliminate them uh, using safe uh, way. Of course, taking antibiotics kill bacteria, but mm -hmm. you have to destroy your gut microbiome as well. Mm -hmm. So what we use is laser uh, that is activating water. So all bacteria, viruses have water in them. So when the laser shine it, we evaporate this kind of bacteria and we can cut across the whole spectrum to reduce them to a certain number below our uh, that threshold and the immune system can take over. And that treatment has to be repeated a number of times? Uh, usually it's just like um, a big spring cleaning, right? You do it once, right? The rest of the time is about just uh, maintenance. So we also provide our patient uh, with a home care system using ozonated water. Right, so they can actually generate ozone water from tap water mm. by the system breaking down using hydrolysis water into hydrogen and oxygen, combining oxygen to become ozone. And then the ozone helps in killing all these bacteria. Awesome. Um, I haven't spoken about a study in this podcast, but I feel like you might be freaking out a bit. Oh. So can I, I thought you were thought thought having calm, a bad day. No, can I just calm you down? Yeah, here we go. Right. So it's quite an e and it's quite an easy study to read. So for people listening, and we'll put the we'll put the so link up. Easy. Will I be able to cope with it? No. Nah, well, touch and go. <laughs> um, 2016 in Nature, right? They were reporting on this kind of thing, and I'm gonna, let's see if you can guess. There were how many? What percentage of Americans at the age of 30 do you think have periodontal disease? It's a gum like gum disease, essentially, right? Of Americans. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No. Careful. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, uh, Twenty-five percent. Even that would be bad, wouldn't it? Thirty-eight percent. That is huge. Yeah. Right. Okay, I'm going to share with you another number. You can go to the Singapore National Dental Center and look at that section on gum disease, gingivitis, and periodontitis. Ninety percent of the population has either the gingivitis or periodontitis. Wow, yeah. my goodness. Right. Tell, the, tell the breath that. That yeah. would affect the virus. So the European <laughs> Federation of Periodontology also did something. It's uh, close to 80 odd percent. So for the longest time, for the last 20 years, we tried to bring this number down. We failed. Yeah. What's going on? What, okay, let's, what, what can people listening, let's give, let's give everyone three things to do to optimize our oral health. Yeah. I think uh, first thing first is depend on yourself, right? Yeah. So one good thing is really don't let the oral cavity dry up. It's like, can you don't blink? You can't, right? Once you don't blink, your eye doesn't get the tear. Your eye cornea is not going to be protected. Same for your teeth. Everything in your mouth needs saliva protection, buffering, antibacteria, the sheer flow of it. Close your mouth, keep it tight. That's number one. Second is that um, brushing your teeth, obvious, right? Okay. But flossing is the controversial thing. So for the 2013 paper, say that it doesn't really protect you from gum disease and decay. Uh, reason is that if you just use a single uh, strand floss going in and out, you can remove chunks of food and stuff, but it won't disrupt the bacterial colony. So what is advice is now like using things like water pig, yeah, uh, air floss, right? Good. So you flush those water through, the speed of the, the water going through disrupt the colony, break the cell wall, uh, then this will really help. And we are also now thinking about even adding like things like ozonated water, right? So it's going to be even double the kill. So I've just started using the water pick. I'm astounded mm. that other picks are available. Um, I'm, I'm astounded that when I, so I, 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 I brush my teeth first, then I use the water pick, and then I've got this little tool. It's got like a little red sort of rubbery thing on the end of it. And I go in between my teeth, to and there's still food between my teeth after doing those two stages. Mm. I'm so disgusted with myself that for like 35 years before that, I didn't do those two stages. How many times should we be using the water pick a day? And and should it when do you do it after brushing, before brushing? What's what would you advise? So What's you see, protocol? The, the thing is that right, um, 
the the type of food that we eat will uh, result in the kind of uh, fermentation and also the kind of bacteria that it might just um, yeah so it's very it's not like one cu cookie cutter kind of uh, way but all can I say is that uh, I think when we um, allow things to get trapped between the teeth right there's uh, fermentation right no saliva fermentation so as long you you feel that there's something in there due to the uh, the food that you take you want to clean it out just go ahead there's no like you can't overuse it in my opinion and is drinking water helpful so you, you know if you've had a coffee is it good to flush that with water you know is it does that re change the acidity in the in the in the oral cavity your your saliva is always about 7 to 7.2 uh, pH 7, 7 to 7 so it's about neutral to slightly mm. alkaline so depend on your, your saliva, I think it will be uh, just good enough. You don't have to just let you water, okay. in my opinion, personal so, opinion. And so what, what, what Singaporeans doing wrong? Like what, what are the, mm. like as a group? No, this number is really huge. Oh, I, 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 I really don't know, right? Mm. So, so Maybe the they're mouth breathing all the time. You said that the, the airway issues in That's Southeast right. Asians, right? Very so good. Maybe it's the mouth breathing. There's one part. The, diet. the second part is also... Um, um, uh, maybe diet, maybe diet. But I feel also when we uh, look at this whole problem, um, we we use utilization rate of dental services mm. in Singapore isn't that like all, all the whole population do go to see the dentist. Mm. So I think um, I think when they, it's always a skewed group of uh, people when they come and then you're doing a survey and then yeah. You happen to see a lot of these issues, yeah. Yeah. and there, I, there was me thinking it was the Brits with the bad teeth. <laughs> well, the big old yellow tombstones we've got. Um, I've been absolutely fascinated by today. Thank mm. you. Um, thank you so much for for sharing all of that. Um, we we like to move on at this point to yep. our favourite sections, don't we? Yep, we would. Um, so our favourite segments uh, are pet peeve. So it's like our one pet peeve for the profession and so if you can give us your pet peeve for your profession the thing that really disturbs you about your profession or annoys you of course it comes to this point of uh, let's say dental extraction so I, I feel that um, I can't, I, I, I'm not in a position to, to I say to criticize it's just that I'm just saying uh, every single tooth is a structure unit yes we do look out for uh, aestheticism uh, alignment function but we have to correlate this whole oral system to the craniofacial system to then of course the whole body system there is uh, a role for every single part of us right so we need to really try our best right to uh, preserve every single tooth it comes to this point of course the wisdom tooth uh, is not finding a space because our jaw is getting smaller as we uh, you know evolve mm. okay so um, that is one big problem but if we can don't extract teeth for orthodontics, let's try. Try our best to find an uh, alternative way. But if there's no other option, so be it. Mm. Yep. Fantastic. Fantastic. And then uh, now, um, Dr. Yu, we're going to move on to our favorite segment. Okay. And this is the magic wand segment. Not, Not like, like that. that. <laughs> um, and this is where we, um, it's a statement for your one wish for your patient group? What I want is really um, that they have the ability to understand uh, themselves and health well uh, so that they can heal themselves. Uh, because our body is so clever, um, we just want to, don't want to put things in our way. Let's not depend too much on externality. Know the body well so that um, you can uh, find health in everywhere you go. Yep. Well, I think, I think uh, everyone's going to have learned a lot from this podcast from you today um, and I think they'll be able to, to apply it and I think that that's what why we're doing the podcast isn't it so that everyone understands a bit more about their health and everything that can affect exactly. their health as well so I really admire that your effort because uh, putting this together is not easy and uh, thinking about this all this uh, questions and the whole flow I really thank you for giving me this opportunity to share because um, it's we always want to look for this this discussion because to me it's like I, I, I pitch my elevator pitch to everybody yeah and a few uh, you know like-minded individual 
picked it up and say let's 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 think harder about it. Mm. And this is where we are now talking about it too. So I really appreciate this uh, effort of yours and this opportunity that you're giving to me. You're very welcome. Yeah. It's been an honor to listen to you. Thank you. Thank yeah. you for sharing. Thank you so much for listening um, and joining us on our collaborative journey to health. Thank you so much to Dr. Yu for joining us today and sharing um, so coherently and so interestingly um, and especially for empowering the people listening to make changes to their own health. Please do smash the like button, uh, make sure that you're subscribed. And if you have any questions or anything that you want to see from us, then please do let us know in the comments. So in the next episode, um, we've got another special guest um, and I'm really looking forward to it. So in the next episode, we're going to be talking about testosterone. And this is a huge thing for us, a huge thing for me as I've been taking a testosterone supplement since I was young. And I'm really looking forward to sharing my experiences and discussing this with our expert next time. So thanks again for listening. Keep your tongue on the roof of your mouth and your lips closed and take care. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.